The second most important day of the year is the day that he laid down his life and gave his life for us on the cross Amen. of Calvary. The day that he purchased our redemption. The day that the darling of heaven was crucified as the song that we just sung said. And uh, as we think about the scene that leads to what we would say is a travesty, we need to remember as horrible and tragic as this scene is, it was all planned by God. And the Lord Jesus Christ accepted it willingly. He could have called a legion of angels. He, he could have just spoken the word. But no one took his life. He laid it down of himself. And because he laid it down, he also could take it up again, which is exactly what he did on Easter Sunday morning. But hundreds of years before this event ever took place, a prophet by the name Isaiah prophesied what the Lord Jesus Christ would face and go through as he gave his life on Calvary's cross. And as we read these verses, which we read a few of these a few weeks ago, I want you to think about this question. Why? Just that one question. As you read these verses with me, ask yourself the question, why? And you will see that question answered as we read Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12 together. This again is a prophecy given hundreds of years before Jesus ever gave his life concerning what Jesus would go through. And Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Why? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him. A portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Why? Because he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. As you see this passage of Scripture before us, the question why is answered over and over again. Why did he suffer? Why? Did he go to the cross? Why did he allow himself to be abused and tortured unlike any person has ever experienced on the face of this earth? The answer to these questions can be answered in this passage of Scripture. Why? It was for our grief and for our sorrows. Why? It was because of our transgressions and our iniquities. Why? It was for our peace. It was so the wounds that sin has created in our life could be healed. Why? It was our sin. Why? It was for our 
righteousness. Why? It was because of our transgressions. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and gave His life. When we look in the mirror, we see why. It was us. For God so loved the world what did He do? That He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We were the reason that He gave His life, that He sacrificed Himself, that we might be made His righteousness, that, that our unrighteousness could be washed away and that we could have His righteousness and our name could be written down in the Lamb's book of life and we could have life and have it more abundantly. We are the reason that He gave His life. And as we take this journey together this morning, we begin in the upper room. They were there to celebrate the Passover together. It was probably, as far as the disciples were concerned, another routine Passover meal. They were going to recall what had happened in Egypt so many years ago. They were going to eat the, uh, the, the, the Passover lamb together. They were going to think about the great deliverance that God had delivered through Moses all those thousands of years before. But dear friend, this Passover meal would be unlike any Passover meal they had ever experienced together. As a matter of fact, it would be the last Passover meal they would experience together. Jesus said, I will not eat this meal with you again until... One of these days we're going to sit down together at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're going to sit there and we're going to be there together with the Lord in heaven. But as He begins to teach them about the representation of this unleavened bread that would be broken and how His body, not His bones, but His body would be broken as He would be crucified for the sin of the world and then the fruit of the vine would be represented by the precious blood that He would shed and pour out for the sins of the world and and how he helped them to understand the significance of the, the, the first Passover and how he himself was the Passover lamb who was going to be sacrificed and give himself as a, as a sacrifice for sin. And as they were talking during this holy night, an unholy argument broke out. I'm amazed at how like these disciples are to us. These men had walked with the Lord Jesus Christ every day for the last three and a half years. And as Jesus was trying to get through their heads, they probably had a thick head like me, trying to get through their heads the understanding of what this meal represented and what the Lord's Supper would represent as we partake of it over and over again throughout the centuries, they start arguing about who's the greatest. I don't know why that argument started. I kind of got a feeling it may have started because Jesus had revealed to them that that night one of them would betray him. And maybe that argument was uh, started as a, out of a, as a concept. Well, I'm not going to betray him. And I'm not going to betray him. And I'm not going to betray him. I'm too good for that. I couldn't do that. That would never, it would never be me. And maybe that argument started as a result of that, of that prophecy. I really don't know why they had that argument. I do know they had had it on other occasions. I do know that James and John's mother wanted Jesus to give them a seat on both sides of the throne. You know, have one of them there and one of them here. And, and Jesus said, hey, that's not mine to give. But I tell you what they are going to do. They're going to suffer just like I suffered. All of the disciples suffered a martyr's death except John who was boiled in hot oil and then sent off to the Isle of Patmos to die alone. All of the disciples, save Judas, of course, who was the betrayer, suffered a horrible death, and he went out and killed himself. We'll talk about that in a moment. But as they're arguing over who's the greatest, the Lord Jesus takes off his outer garment, and he kneels and he begins to wash their feet. Now here they are having an argument about who's the greatest, you know, who's the best disciple, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God, and the Son of God, God robed in human flesh, takes upon himself the form of a servant and he begins to wash the grime and the manure and the dust and all of the things that they had gotten on their feet that day on the dusty streets of Jerusalem and he takes upon himself that responsibility to remind them, I did not come to be served, I came to serve. I did not come to be ministered to, but I came to minister. And he 
I think silences their arguments about who's the greatest. And there, that night, he demonstrated what greatness was all about. And that is found in serving one another. The Bible says that after that, they sung a hymn. And they headed out to the Mount of Olives. I can imagine the anguish that Jesus must have begun to feel at that moment as he's trying in these last few hours that he has with his disciples trying to get these concepts into their mind and they're dull of hearing, their heads are hardened, their ears are, are, are deafened to the concepts that he's trying to get through to them and they're arguing about petty things that don't make a difference and don't really matter. And he understands that in just a few hours, Judas is going to betray him. Peter's going to deny him. All of the other disciples are going to run away because they're in fear for their life. And I think some of the anguish began even in that upper room. As they head now to the Mount of Olives and Jesus and Peter begin to have a discussion. Jesus warns them on this journey as they're going to the garden. He says, all will fall away because of me this night. And Matthew 26 says that Peter speaks up as he often did and said, nope, not me, Lord. I don't know what everybody else is going to do, but I know that I'm not going to deny you. Lord, as a matter of fact, I will die before I deny you. Lord, I'm... I know these other guys, they're not, they're not as strong as me, and they're, they're not as good as me, and, and they don't love you as much as I do, but Lord, they're not gonna, they may deny you, but not me, Lord. You can count on me, God. You can count on me. It's not going to happen. Jesus informs Peter that not only, Peter, are you going to fall away, just like all the other disciples are, but you're going to deny me three times before this night is over. I think that's why Jesus warns Peter in the garden of these words. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can anybody relate to that besides me? How many times have we had the best of intentions? We come to church on Sunday and we get fired up and we get encouraged and we leave out of here ready to charge hell with a squirt gun and, you know, everything's just great. Everything's wonderful. You know, all of the problems of last week are gone and we're just ready to start a new week fresh. And before you know it, those best intentions have fallen by the wayside and we find ourselves back in the same rut we were to begin. You know, Peter's made out of the same stuff we are, isn't he? Peter said, or Jesus said, Peter, I know you've got good intentions. And Peter, I know that you want to do the right thing. And Peter, I know that you want to do uh, what is right. And I know you don't plan to deny me. I know that you don't intend to deny me. But Peter, your flesh is a whole lot weaker than you realize. Did you know yours is too? The Bible says, Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. We've got to learn to depend upon God's strength, not our own strength. So Jesus, I'm sure the anguish continues to increase as he looks into the eyes of his well-intentioned disciple and knows in just a few short hours he's going to deny even knowing the Lord. As they come to the Garden of Gethsemane, the agony in the garden, the Bible tells us that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him while he prays and the other disciples are asked to sit and wait and he explains to these three disciples, some call these men the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He says, my soul is on the verge of death. And as he begins to pray, he says to the Father, he says, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And much debate has been spoken about what cup is he referring to? Is he talking about the physical anguish that he knows is coming? The torture that we'll talk about, the crucifixion that we'll talk about, all of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to suffer. Is that the cup that he's referring to? Well, no doubt that was part of the cup, but I don't think that was, I don't think that's what he was talking about. I think the cup is the knowledge that he had that for the first time in all of eternity, God the Father and God the Son 
to some degree were going to be separated as God the Father turned His back because He cannot look upon sin. And as the sin of the world was placed on the shoulders of Christ and He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That cup of all of the sin of all of the world, the, the wrath of God, the hell, if you will, that I should have suffered, that was going to be poured upon the Lord Jesus Christ as He thought about that cup, and He thought about the cup that He was going to have to drink, and He thought about the fact that He was going to cry out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He said, Lord, if there's some other way, but there was no. You know, we, and I want to say this as politely as I know how, but when we try to bypass the cross, we might as well spit in the face of God. Amen. Because, dear friend, there was no other way. I believe with all of my heart if that prayer could have been answered with a resounding yes that night, God would have answered that prayer and said, okay, let's go to plan B. There was no plan B. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. No man, woman, nobody comes to the Father except through Him. And he says, God, I don't want to drink this cup, but I'm willing to drink this cup because I love the souls of men and women and boys and girls. And I want to spend eternity with them in heaven. And I want them to experience eternal life forever and abundant life right here and right now. So yes, I don't want to drink this cup, but I'm willing to drink this cup. Not my will, but thine be done. The Bible says that he comes back and he finds Peter and James and John and the rest of the disciples asleep. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? The Bible says that he returns back and he begins to pray again. And the Bible says that it is during this time that his sweat became as great drops of blood. There is a medical condition called hematidrosis, and this condition results in excretion of blood or blood pigment in the sweat. Under conditions of great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can rupture, mixing blood with perspiration. This condition has been reported in 76 cases in the 20th century, and studies have found that this condition happens during this situation when there is either acute fear or intense mental contemplation are found to be the most frequent inciting causes of this thing called hematridosis. While the extent of blood loss is generally minimal, Hematridosis also results in the skin becoming extremely tender and fragile, which would have made his other tortures that he was going to face throughout the night even more painful. Put a quote on the screen. It says, from these factors, is it evident that even before Jesus endured the torture of the cross, he suffered far beyond what most of us will ever suffer? Imagine being under such emotional stress and such emotional turmoil that the capillaries in your skin burst and your perspiration is mixed with blood, that is what Jesus was facing that night in the Garden of Gethsemane as he thought about what he was getting ready to go through in a few short hours. His penetrating awareness of the heinous nature of sin its destructive and deadly effects, the sorrow and heartache that it inflicts, and the extreme measure necessary to deal with it make the passion of Christ beyond comprehension. The Bible says that he comes back and once again finds them sleeping. It's at that time, I think maybe the first or second time, that Jesus reminds Peter, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He tells them after the praying a third time to wake up that the betrayer is at hand. The betrayal by a friend. Tony dealt with this last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But I can only imagine as he looked in Judas's eyes that one last time. 
The man that had walked with him for three and a half years, the man that he knew in his foreknowledge would betray him, the man that he knew in his foreknowledge was a thief, the man he knew was greedy and was only concerned about himself, and he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Did not catch Jesus by surprise, but surely it added to his pain. He was sold out by a kiss. As Tony was preaching that message last week, I, my mind kept thinking about Esau. You remember the story of Esau? Esau had come back. He was hungry. He was tired. and He was, felt like he was going to die if he didn't get something to eat. And his brother Jacob, that deceiver, said, well, I'll give you something to eat, but it's going to cost you. And Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Judas sold out the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And I think about this verse when I think about Esau. The Bible says, Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal, for you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. I want to chase a rabbit real quick. Something that we need to get a hold of. I am so thankful that when we trust Christ as our Savior, the righteousness of Christ is given to us. And that when God looks at us, He no longer sees our sin, judiciously speaking. He now only sees the righteousness of Himself, the righteousness of Christ, and He is able to welcome us and bring us into His family because of that. But we need to also understand the reality that salvation does not necessarily mean that all consequences of our choices are gone. I think about so many young people who sacrifice who sacrifice their virginity and, and, and lay it on an altar for a moment of pleasure. And so many, I, I've never met one person, I've never met one person who waited till they got married and said, I, I wish I hadn't waited. I've never met one person that's ever said that, but I've met many people who said, I wish I had have waited. And they, and, and they, and they, and they sell that away, they give that away for a moment of pleasure. And oftentimes, as a result, live with a lifetime of pain. And Esau, for, for a bowl of soup, gave away his birthright. And now, though he went out and cried and repented and wept, there was nothing he could do to change what he had done. Please understand, God's grace and God's forgiveness is wonderful and this amazing thing, but that does not give you a license to go out and sin. We can choose what we want to do, but we cannot choose the consequences for what we do. Let's be careful that from this day forward, the decisions that we make are not going to be decisions that we're going to have to look back on with regret. Esau made a decision and he said, well, I'll just go and, and say I'm sorry and everything will be okay. Everything wasn't okay. And Judas went and said, hey, take the money back. I don't want it. I betrayed innocent blood. But he could not go back and undo what he had done. We aren't allowed to choose the consequences for our choices. Now we move on to Peter. Jesus is led now from the garden to the high priest's house and Peter is confronted three times. Hey, I know you. You were with him. Peter says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, your speech. You, you speak like a gal. No, I don't know the man. The Bible says it even curses and says, I don't know the man. And that third time, the rooster crowed and Jesus and Peter's eyes met. But I don't think Jesus' face was an I told you so look. 
I think Jesus, just, Jesus' eyes were filled with as much compassion as Peter's ever seen. And you know what? Peter couldn't go back and change what he did either. You know the difference between Peter and Judas? I think the difference between Peter and Judas is found in 2 Corinthians 7.10. The Bible talks about a godly sorrow or a godly grief that produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Some, I believe, I, 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 would, I would be willing, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I'd be willing to bet that there's probably some people in this room right now that are experiencing worldly grief. And that grief has led you to hopelessness. That grief over, over your past and your mistakes and things that you have done, the things that you have done against God and the consequences for your choices, you just feel like there absolutely is no hope for you. That is worldly grief. Godly grief does not lead to hopelessness. Godly grief, grief rather, leads to the God of all hope that forgives, that cleanses, that restores, and that enables you to move forward regardless of your past decisions and go forward for the glory of God. That is the difference between worldly grief and godly grief. Amen. And Peter had godly grief. I mean, in a sense... In, in one sense, what Peter did was just as bad as what Judas had done. He sold Jesus out to save his own hide. I'm not going to identify with him because if I do, I might be in the same situation he's in. But Peter's grief led him to go out, the Bible says, and weep bitterly. And it led him right back to who he left. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody in this room has made mistakes. And everybody in this room has things in their life they wish they could go back and do differently. And everybody in this room has things in their life that wish they could go back and change. Let me tell you, dear friend, do not let those those regrets lead you to hopelessness. Let those regrets lead you to the God of all hope who can forgive you and restore you and cleanse you and make you all and help you go forward from this day forward for the glory of God. Quit looking back. Yes, we need to learn from the past. And yes, to a degree, we need to remember the past. But we do not need to live in the past. And Judas's grief led him to suicide and taking his own life, whereas Peter's grief led him to be restored to the Lord. And so let me encourage you this morning to turn that grief into seeking Christ. What will you do with your sins and the things that you regret? Will you allow them to drive you to hopelessness or to hope? And then we move on to the trials, and I must hurry. The first stop was with the religious leaders. Jesus is mocked and beaten. He's blindfolded. He's asked to prophesy who hit him. They blaspheme Jesus. They question him. Jesus claims he will soon be seated at the right hand of power. And they consider this blasphemy and ship him off to Pilate. Pilate was a leader, political leader, and he asked about these accusations. Jesus speaks very little to Pilate, very, offers no defense, but Pilate cannot find any fault in Christ. There's nothing worthy of death. And Jesus explains to Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, Pilate does not seem to be threatened of the fact that he calls himself a king. He hears that Jesus had spent some time ministering in Galilee. And he says, well, that's Herod's jurisdiction. I can get him out of my hair. I'll send him off to Herod. Herod's very glad to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. He heard about the things that Jesus had done and the miracles Jesus had performed. And so, you know, he thinks Jesus is this circus act and Jesus is going to, you know, entertain him for a few minutes and Jesus doesn't entertain him for a few minutes. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't speak one word to Herod. Herod sends him back to Pilate. Pilate still doesn't know what to do. So he comes up with a scheme. 
It's this time of year that we can pardon a criminal. So the Bible says that he finds a notorious criminal by the name of Barabbas, and he sits Barabbas and Jesus in front of the crowd, thinking in his mind, they're surely not going to let this notorious criminal go. They'll let Jesus go. But the crowd cries out for Jesus' blood. The crowd cries out for Jesus' crucifixion. And Pilate finally succumbs to the crowd's request and sends Jesus off to be purged as the torture intensifies. He, they prepare him for crucifixion with a process called scourging. When a person would be scourged, they would take a leather whip and at the end of that whip they would tie pieces of bone and pieces of glass and pieces of broken pottery and other items at the end of that whip and as they would whip the person, as they would tie that person's hands to a post and the skin on their back would be very tight and they would begin to whip them and that would begin to, to break open the, uh, the, the flesh on the person's back and lower rib cage and abdomen. Sometimes people died in the scourging. Sometimes they would literally rip organs out during the scourging and the midsection and back would be ripped open and vital organs would be exposed. Some of the soldiers heard Jesus' claim that he was a king, and so they found a scarlet or a purple robe, and they put that robe on uh, his back that is now bleeding, and someone weaves together these Palestinian thorns. They're very long, very sharp, and they weave it together in a crown and place it on his head. They find a stick, a reed, and put it in his hand, and they mock him, and they pretend to bow before him as if he is their king, and they spit in his face and, and uh, they rip that robe off of his back that surely by now has clotted to the material of that robe and his back is reopened and the rivers of blood once again begin to flow. And they lead him down this journey of the what we would call the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering. He would carry that cross beam up Golgotha's hill in front of the crowds that are gathered there in Jerusalem to the place of the skull, the place called Golgotha. And on this journey it is assumed that Jesus, who had been awake all night, suffered untold mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion, either falls beneath the weight of the cross or is just not going fast enough for those in the procession. So they force a man named Simon to carry Jesus' cross. And though we do not know for sure what happened to Simon that day, it may have gone something like this. I was going into the city to celebrate the Passover and he, he was being let out of the city as a Passover lamb. But we didn't, we didn't understand that. Um, when I got to Jerusalem, it wasn't what I expected. There was like, Ten times more people there than the last time that I'd, I'd been there to celebrate Passover, and it just seemed like the whole city was angry, like just, just mobs of angry people. And there was there was people crying. I saw the Roman soldiers were uh, they were they were shoving people out of the way. You know, m making room for for this man who um, put a, a, a beam across his back. He was making his way down the road, and people were shouting his name, Jesus. Um. I was, I was trying to make sense of it all. The, the shouting, the, the crying, there's so much weeping. Um, and all of a sudden this, this, this guard, the soldier, he, he grabs me. And I mean, he literally just pulls me out of the crowd and he says, for me to carry this guy's cross, If, if this guy's blood get, gets on me, it's, it stains me, and I, I, can't, I can't celebrate the Passover. That, that's the whole reason I was there. 
And then I saw what all the commotion was about. I saw him. It was a man who had uh, claimed to be the son of God, or, or at least what was, was left of him. It was hard to see the man through the blood. The, uh, the, the best way that I can describe it is it was like pounds of, of beaten flesh standing there. And then, um, and then our eyes met. And I knew this man was not a liar. He was not a, uh, a crazy man with grand ideas. He was, he was the Messiah carrying his cross. I, uh, I sh shouldered, I shouldered the cross, and I, I put my arm around Jesus to help him stand up. His, uh, his knees were were buckling under the weight. It, it was more than the weight of, of, of a cross beam. It was, he, he, he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. I carried um, what I could, but he, uh, he, carried, he carried most of it. And we, uh, we we began we began to walk. I I I heard the insults that that they shouted at him and and now at me. I felt the spit. I felt his his blood on me. I saw the the wounds, the scars on his body. They'd um they they they'd taken a a crown made of thorns and then they smashed it on his head and, and, and blood ran into his eyes. And the crowd, they just kept yelling, where's your God now? Save yourself. Prophesy. They just kept, they just kept, they just kept laughing at him. We got to, we got to Calvary, and um, they laid him out on a cross, and they they nailed his hands and his feet to it, and they 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 lifted it up, and he. He had, he had all of his weight on that one spike through his feet. And he would, he would, he would push up with all of his might and, and gasp for a breath to stay alive. And I, 
I couldn't watch it. He did that for hours. I couldn't watch it. And, and I looked down. And I remember, I remember seeing my hands. My hands were stained with, with his blood, the, the blood that I thought would, would make me unclean. And I realized it's the blood, it's the blood that, that makes me clean. He, uh, he breathed his last breath and he died. And that was a, uh, that was the day that I helped Jesus carry. That was the day that I helped Jesus carry my cross. He hung and died on my cross. <laughs> 